Hello and welcome. In this new episode of My Time with Radha, I, Katie Taher, had the special privilege of speaking with Swami Satyananda about her time spent with Swami Shivananda Radha. We talked about harmony and how words of inspiration can touch an inner chord in others. I hope you enjoy listening. Namaste, everyone, and welcome. My name is Katie, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Swami Satyananda, joining us from Yashodra Ashram. And we're here to have a conversation about her experience with Swami Radha's teachings. Hi, Swami Satyananda. Hi, Katie. I'm very happy to be here with you today. Thank you so much for joining me. And I had asked Swami Satyananda if there was a prayer that she would like to begin this podcast, this interview with. And I think you had decided on the Divine Mother Prayer. Uh, the Divine Mother Prayer is one of my personal favorites, and I think for many people who come to the ashram. And it's a prayer that Swami Radha um, encouraged us to say because it is an offering prayer. And it brings that sense of um, a devotional aspect into every day. And of course, there's all the questions of what am I devoted to and <laughs> all of that, that clarifies. But it's all actions of my hands, my speech, everything, all my pleasures. May everything I do be taken as I worship. And so to me, it's a reminder that when I get caught in the busyness of every day, that there's another place to go and lift what I'm doing, no matter what it is, into my heart. And so a little bit about the prayer. Beautiful. So we'll say the prayer together and people who are listening from afar can, can also say it with us. O oh, Divine Mother. May all my speech and idle talk be mantra. All actions of my hands be mutra. All eating and drinking be the offering of oblations unto thee. All lying down prostrations before thee. May all pleasures be as dedicating my entire self unto thee. May everything I do be taken as I worship. And what a wonderful way to kind of set the tone for this interview, too, in that sense of devotion and creating this as really, for me, an offering um, to the ashram and to Swami Radha's legacy. Um, and so the, one of the first questions that I have for you is actually something that I don't personally know about at all, and it's how you first encountered the teachings and kind of your first glimpse into Swami Radha's work and practices? Well, I first heard of Swami Radha. I was living in Saskatchewan, which is where I grew up, and I was in high school. And I was probably about 15. Yeah, see, you didn't know that. <laughs> no, I did not. Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and um, I have to say that, I'll tell you a little, little bit about how that happened, and I have to say that I forgot about that because British Columbia seemed so far away to me in my life at the time because <laughs> I hadn't traveled very much. Right. And, uh, and then my first year of living at the Ashram, I came across one of the publications from that time. Okay. So I'll give you, and, it, and then the whole memory came back. So what it was was my neighbors who lived across the street, a family, um, were traveling to the Ashram. And this is in the very first years of the Ashram and they were helping there, so they would come back, and um, their daughter and I were best friends, and we, we were in high school, and, and um, they would tell me about it. It's like they wanted to share their experience, <laughs> and I remember exactly where I was, and I and they described Swami Radha in a way that I it just went into my heart something, but I did think. It's so far away. <laughs> Will I, would I ever be able to go there? And then, you know, fast forward a few years, and uh, I was mar newly married, and I was about, I was 22, and uh, we had, my husband and I were finishing our education and trying to decide where to move from British Columbia to Newfoundland. 
And then we settled, we met people, you know, connected to our to work in Kimberley, which is directly across the Purcell mountain range from the ashram. Anyway, uh, we came, we moved to Kimberley and I had a job as a school teacher with young children. And on the staff was a teacher who had just come back for the three month yoga course from the ashram. And uh, neither of us were smokers. And so instead of going in the staff room at that time, <laughs> this was the early 1970s. <laughs> right. We would come to each other's classroom and she just was telling me all about her experience, the teaching. And there was also one of the parents of um, a child, a young child who had just come back from a karma yoga program. And same thing. She just, I remember her just standing there in front of me and just full of body to tell me. About it. <laughs> so anyway, the teacher who had just come back uh, was offering healthy yoga classes in our community. And so for 10 years, I was taking the classes and learning, listening to her experience and getting a scent magazine in the mail. And so that was, when I look back on it, it's like a foundation was already being prepared for the time in my life when things were not going as well as they were at that time. Um, then it turned me towards going to the ashram. Wow. And so how long was it like from when you started going to the Hatha practices until you actually went to the ashram? Well, uh, about 10 years. 10 so years. So I always say, don't give up on people <laughs> if they have to get back to do yeah. that type of, When the time is right and circumstances come up, um, then that, then something is there. And that's what I found about going back to, oh my gosh, I heard about the ashram when I was 15 and had forgotten about that. Wow. Yeah. And when was it that you kind of put two and two together, like noticing, realizing that that 15 year old um, kind of exposure was the same as the one that you heard about at school? Well, and I didn't then. You didn't? No, no, no. It was like it was new to me, but Brand new. for some reason, I had an interest in yoga, you know, maybe from that time in high school, who knows, and was getting books out of the library and trying to do the poses and reading and yeah. So it's, uh, that's why I, I, I really encourage people as I was encouraged, all of us encouraged to um, keep reflecting, keep track of our journey and process of learning. Because even now, after all these years, I'm going back into all the time going back into oh what we said about oh and then seeing <laughs> a bigger sense of the path of my own life and it just brings a lot of joy mm -hmm. yeah yeah it sounds like a large kind of unfolding process that's then led you here yeah 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 it did wow and so do you remember sort of the first visit that you had to the ashram? Was it for a specific course or what was that like? Well, I had reached, I think you'll appreciate this, although you're not there yet, but it was the end of my 20s. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I kept journals kind of off and on since my teens. And so I was, I was writing about, you know, how much I'd been learning and how how happy I was in my life and, and you know, looking out, I even wrote, what, what will the next decade bring? <laughs> and then I had a prayer there, a prayer about that I would keep on learning. And I even addressed it to God, which, you know, I was a, like consciously into God things because I had, I had some good experiences with that. And so, um, yeah, and so things right after that began to happen. <laughs> I see now in response to my prayer that I want to keep growing, and I also said I want 
wanted to lead a fulfilling life. And from this perspective, I look back and go, okay, something really did respond to that. And so I had um, reached a time in my life, in my early 30s, where I had, you know, completed, I had sold a business that I had started. And um, and I was at kind of feeling purposeless, um, not sure where my, everything I tried, the doors weren't opening. And um, and so I was starting to feel, what am I going to do? What am I going to do with my life? And then after that, I had an experience, the closest I never come to, like it was a near-death experience. And it brought me to a place of knowing something in, really had changed in my life, but I didn't know what it was. And I think, like, I really made a promise, like, I want to live. Like, <laughs> I made it, some kind of promise on that deepest, I want to live. And again, it was shortly after that then, in my journals, I was writing about the changes I wanted to make in my life. And I look at it now, and it was like one of our ideal sessions, because I was looking at mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. <laughs> and uh, I think that came from all the reading of the sense over the years, <laughs> the type, right? And, uh, and I had wrote in there steps I was going to take, and the next one, one of them was to go to the ashram. Never been here. And I wrote, they may not have any of the answers, but it'll be a step. And of course, knowing what we know now about the ashram, no, we don't get the answers. It's more questions. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a place to bring the questions. So when I came here the first time, yeah, it was in, almost going into depression because uh -huh. I didn't know what to do with my life. And I came for an ideals workshop, which was at the end of the 10 days, which I don't think they do. I mean, we haven't done that. Usually you're uh -huh. you yeah. not to, but it was the workshop I entered. The first questions were to reflect on what is the purpose of your life? What means, brings you meaning? What makes it worthwhile? And they scared me. Those questions scared me because I had never really brought them to the surface before. And I think in today's world, just a little aside, with what's happening with COVID and people having to step back and look at their lives, that, I mean, we are seeing more people here who are coming asking those questions. And so it is like a, a, a maybe not a starting place, but it's a place of bringing it forward and actually reflecting about those questions and making choices. Uh -huh. Yeah, wow. There's just two things that I want to note is that for people who might not know, Ascent Magazine is a publication Bajillion. that was, um, how would you describe it, like published through the ashram for many, many years and yes. very successful at that too, like worldly recognized. Yeah, it started, um, I think, as a newsletter in the first year and then uh, it was an in-house publication and we used to come you know every Christmas or whatever we'd be collating and putting them all together into a little publication with a prayer list and everything so we'd go out and then I can't remember exactly the dates um, but in the 2000s then a group of young people connected with the ashram some who had grown up here uh, took it to Montreal and they then made it uh, publication that really um, focused on looking at yogi incognitos, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it you know it had some articles by Swami Radha, Swami Radhananda, who was a successor to Swami Radha, and Swami Lalitananda, who is now the current president of the ashram, and um, and then and as well as from a variety of people different yoga traditions, but also walks of life. And yeah, so it was, it's, it's um, not being published anymore because it reached, of course, a place where it was just far too expensive to keep this. But it's definitely, definitely, it's still available online and there's paper editions, but so many people are still say how much they, you know, enjoyed it, read it and got from it. So well, it was and, just another vehicle. Yeah. 
And it's it was the articles that I've kind of engaged with and the different volumes that I've read. I mean, it's really ahead of its time, I would think and say. Um, yeah, so it's it's a beautiful publication from the ashram. And the other thing that I wanted to kind of go back to is what you said about a place to bring your questions, because I think it's true in that, you know, at, I think a lot of people may think that going to the ashram or a spiritual place at all would kind of bring in all these answers. But really, <laughs> what we've seen <laughs> like, through experience is there's just more and more questions that come up and need to yeah. be addressed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you, was there something that, you know, I mean, besides the what is the purpose of your life that was clearly one of the large questions that was put in front of you, but are there, is there like something else that kind of came up for you in that kind of first exposure to the place of the ashram that begged a question for you to ponder on that you hadn't really thought about before? Well, when I first came here, I was, I remember driving down the road towards the ashram, which is kind of a windy road. And, um, and I remember being nervous because I'd never been here before. I didn't know what I was going to find. And, um, and then when I got out of the car and stood on the land, I had such an overwhelming feeling of being here before. And it was only a weekend that I first came, but I kept having that sense of deja vu. That kind of scared me because I had a life, <laughs> you know, that I had put a lot into that was outside the ashram. Um, but there was no denying that there was something very familiar about the teachings. Well, um, they were responding to something that was inside me. And, I remember that in the workshop, the ideal session that um, I felt like I had uncovered something in myself that was really me, and I had lost that sense uh -huh. of self in the few years before the ashram. And I remember the teacher saying, acknowledging that, the teacher that was the workshop leader, and said, you may want to express gratitude for that in your own way, you know, to, that that's happened. And um, I did go down to the prayer room on the beach, beautiful prayer room. And I, I wrote in my diary, and I remember feeling it, that I felt really awkward because I didn't know what to do there. <laughs> but, you know, like, um, okay. But then once I expressed that gratitude, it was like, Oh, this deep well, a deep feeling and emotion and everything came up. And that was the first time that I, pr I prostrated, felt that. Like, and so, yeah, it really created quite an opening for me in that I didn't even want to leave here that first weekend. <laughs> I just kept later and later and later. Finally, I drove home in the, in the dark. And when I got home, I mean, I knew something had changed for me. And of course, not knowing what that meant can be a little scary too. And so, yeah. Wow. wow. Kept going. How special. Yeah. And you kept going and, and going and going. And here you are now still living at the ashram and you're a full time resident there for a lot of years. Yeah. Yep. Well, after that first experience, of course, I didn't uh -huh. move here right away. No. <laughs> it wasn't even in my mind. <laughs> it wasn't in my mind. Just that I had connected with something that I knew was going to be meaningful. And then my, so I saw me around, it wasn't at the ashram at that time, but a few months later, that was in the fall. And a few months later, this is 1983, uh, she was here. And so my first uh, experience of her was she was giving a satsang talk. And I do not remember, and I didn't write down what it was, but I sure remember the feeling of it was that every word of hers just went straight to my heart. And it resonated with a, an inner truth that I had, and still have, and her words and the teachings have always resonated since then. And even if I fought it at times. <laughs> and then, and then, 
So that was seeing her, and then that night and the next day, our dining room used to be in Main House, which is a little building that was originally here at the ashram for many years. And um, and so I went to a table. It was by a fire a little fireplace, and um, she, I set my mail down. And then next thing, Swami Radha came, and she sat down. And I was—I must say—I was a little—I was a little in awe of her. Oops, I'm so little. Anyway, being a polite, doing the polite thing that I thought was—I introduced myself. Nothing from her. She didn't look up. <laughs> oh from my her. goodness! <laughs> <laughs> she kept eating, and so it just put it back to me. Like it just went. Like everything went. Ah. <laughs> like my insecurity. Uh, what do I do now? And nervousness, like kind of everything going on inside me. That was the rest of the meal. <laughs> and then later at another meal that same day, I, I hadn't got that that was the table that she usually sat at. And so I sat at the same, it was because it was warm <laughs> there. I sat there again. And then next thing, I could see she was heading for it, the table. So I must have seen her heading for that table. Because then anyway, and I thought, no, I'm not going there. I'm going to sit somewhere else. So I sat at another table. And that thing I knew, there was a tap on my shoulder. And one of the residents here said, Sami Rodham wants you to come and sit at her table. Oh, wow. She was <laughs> on to you. <laughs> She was on to me. It was like, okay, we don't have a lot of time to waste, so let's get yeah. into it for a week. And she did. She just, I can't remember what she said. I don't have to look back, but she talked about that with new people, she doesn't always engage in a certain level of conversation. And um, I thought, well, I knew. <laughs> but anyway, I was, I was smart enough by then just to be quiet. Anyway, it lifted to a whole level of conversation with some of the other long-term residents at the table, and it was laughter, and you know, and it was just like okay. And then it, we were into it. I liked her. I really thought this is a special, special person. I don't know what I'm going to do with this because it's scary at the same time. I feel like she can just see right through me. <laughs> Uh, she also spare, had that compassion that was so obvious. Okay. What a beautiful memory. Thank you for sharing that. Wow. <laughs> she totally was on to you, yeah, and could tell that you were kind of yeah. trying to hide maybe a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And is there is there another sort of memory like that that stands out to you from your time with her? either one that kind of highlights a great lesson that maybe she's taught you or just one that you hold really close to your heart? Well, I appreciate your questions, Katie, because there's so many, like every moment ever, through the year, it's, uh, the one that's coming to mind right now is a life seal process um, that I did with her early on. I was in a group um, and there, you rep very briefly, representing uh, parts of ourselves through seals uh, that we draw and it gets a way for the unconscious to speak so we're not it can get past those old stories and begin to see our patterns and the ways out of those in a bigger sense and so it, it starts it's a lifelong process but it gives something very sp specific to look at and in the first one that I did with her, um, she she asked me, I started with my sense of sight, because you draw seals representing your sense of sight. And so I explained a bit about what it was. And then her first question was to me was, how do you see yourself? And I was like, <laughs> I had never really you know, maybe kind of looking at it psychologically or whatever. But the way she asked, I knew that that's not what it's about. And I, I really started just started mumbling kind of things that didn't, she could okay. see probably that I didn't know where what I was going to say. And that's a room full of people. 
And then the next question was, how do you see your place in the world? And of course, this was the very thing that I had brought me to the ashram, and I was fairly new in the teachings, and so I had lost that sense of myself and my place in the world. And so she asked then, you know, how do you see yourself in relation um, to others? And so those questions, and also when I was talking about parts of my life, I used right. the word areas of my life, and she caught that. And she was like, you have to be really specific with yourself. And it's not that it's, I mean, my sense is that like, the teachings aren't saying, this is the way you are forever. It's where I'm at at this point in my life. And so I felt that she was being really, okay. really quite stern with me with those. And then when I listened to the recording after it, she was so soft and gentle, <laughs> you know, but it was the questions that needed to be asked. And so it was that compassion that's fierce, but okay. exactly what's needed at that moment. And now when I, I did a life seal just recently, I've done a few of them over the years, and in preparation for te you know, being in life seals with the group that was here recently, I did my own again. And I brought those questions to myself. Very clearly, I see my strengths, I see my weaknesses, I see the pathways that I'm following. I, you know, like that clarity is there. And so that's where I see the growth in keeping to my path and to the teaching yeah, and keeping wow. that record of it. <laughs> How amazing that you've kind of kept, yeah, the records and the diary, the journals and diaries so you could kind of go back and refer to them to kind of capture that time for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, and anybody who comes here, even if he mm -hmm. hasn't done that, that's a mm -hmm. big part of the process. And I know you have, even before coming to the ashram. And yeah, it's such a gift. It's our lives that we have. <laughs> yeah. And Sami Rada often said, follow the traces in your life. And I love that. And, you know, that's your examples, too that there it was way back then. Where God come from? Opens to the mysterious and then bringing that to a very practical day mm -hmm. to day. Those two realities. Two realities, or, yeah. Two, well, yeah. and I think right now is probably a good time to move to sort of the theme of this interview. Um, and so last time when I had a conversation with Swami Jyoti Ananda, we focused on a quality of Divine Mothers that is kind of creation or creativity. And today I chose harmony as the theme that we'll be discussing. And before we kind of get into that conversation, I thought I would read a little bit from Kundalini Yoga for the West, which is one of Swami Radha's um, great books. Um, it's a... It's a great volume all on the different chakras and different practices that um, are, you know, developed through her and based on her time with Gurudev Shivananda. And there's a section in the fourth chakra on the Anahata chakra where she talks about harmony. So I thought I would read that passage. She writes, Appreciation of the harmonious aspects of life is personified in Saraswati, the goddess of speech, of art, of music. When we can speak words of inspiration that touch an inner chord in another person, we can say that this is the worship of the goddess Saraswati. We thereby have created our own world of harmony in which we function. In preparing for this interview, I felt particularly drawn to this passage as she talks about the words of inspiration that then touch an inner chord in another person. Sort of kind of having this, this idea or this imagination that that would be happening in our conversation, which it already has. So <laughs> yeah, just that feeling of gratitude and, um, and inspiration through another person oh, sure. and how kind of conversations can create that and oh, sure. 
create that harmonious effect. Yeah. And that's what, um, when I first heard Swami Radha, that was it struck an inner chord within my thought, her words. So it's that power You of mentioned speech. that, yeah, you said it resonated. It resonated, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the uh, Saraswati is, yeah, that goddess of speech. And as you said, all of those, and that's our, our lineage of teachings and the, you know, being part of the Saraswati order as a sannyasa. So with harmony, it's an intriguing aspect <laughs> of the teachings. It is very much integral to it. And um, when I look at my life, I see how much more harmony there is. It's more harmonious. And when there's disharmony, or undercurrents there in some way, I know how to bring light, the light of awareness. The, I know how to get back to that place inside myself for the light of compassion, understanding. Like, as you know, the divine light invocation is a, a specific practice for that. Um, but it's really a symbol in many, many traditions of um, being able to lift out of those places that are not harmonious within ourselves. And that's really where it has to start. And um, I was mentioning to you before we began uh, the podcast that, that the words are ha, ha and tha from hatha, the tradition of the physical yoga came to mind when I first began reflecting about harmony. I've reflected about it many times over the years, but I really like, it's always like, what does it mean <laughs> now? What does it mean to me now? And so that's what came first was that balance um, and the word balance because physically hatha gives us that opportunity to look at where am I at, like tadasana, the mountain standing still, where am I at physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, each day, each moment, really, it's like the breath, or, you know, these practices, the yogis were amazing at understanding our human nature. It's the same human nature for thousands of years. <laughs> and here we are, you know, what do we do with that? with the situations we're given, with who we are, the worlds, you know, the worlds that I create, my inner world, that's the place. I keep coming back to where that change has to happen. And another aspect of it is um, knowing where I stand. And so again, Tadasana asks me that, where do I stand? What's my foundation? What are the ethics, my ethics? What do I value? What are my ideals? So, you know, I can see why we keep coming back to that, where do I stand in life? And it just helps me know where am I in alignment or not in alignment with my ideals. And to keep them so they're always evolving and growing with the situation. Well, I don't have to create the situation. Situations, they keep coming to me in life <laughs> that help me understand what do I need to do in this situ you know, a challenging situation. And so how can I um how can I really live those ideals? And that's what the ashram's about, is that day to day karma yoga. And people coming out. I mean, we, we all we're living in community, we're living in a you know, here we see each other every meal throughout the day, working together, and it brings things up. Swami Radha described it as a hothouse. For, yeah, it's just such an experience to be able to face the challenges and to grow for them and keep growing. I also want to mention with Harmony um, the land and how important it is for that to be in a harmonious relationship with the land and the people who have lived here before. And um, on our land, it was the uh, Tanaha and the Sanayaks, and in particular, um, 
with the Yakinuki or a part of the Tanaha, um, there's a lot of relationship building happening and understanding of the land from the perspective of the first peoples here on the land. And for us, too, over the years in the community and nature, developing that harmonious relationship, you know, for example, with the bears. I mean, we're in the forest, right? <laughs> we're in the mountains. And the mountains, so, you know, it's always a thing in the fall where we're trying to harvest the orchards and all of the fruit trees, and then the bears are in there trying to get ready for hibernation and everything. And, and so over the years, we've learned i i mean we're still learning obviously about that relationship like they never they basically let us know when we have to harvest <laughs> so that we could you know get what we need to take us through the winter as well through the season and so yeah it's always that edge of of living with the wild and appreciating that and the land and letting it speak and tell us how to keep developing those harmonious relationships. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, interesting. And a lot of what I'm hearing sort of is that the the quality of balance that's important for harmony, but then also that quality of listening and sort of that openness. And so I'm curious how that played a role in your relationship with Swami Radha, um, particularly like in the later years of knowing her and and the beginnings of how harmony was was in your relationship and kind of in your personal understanding of yourself in relation to her, if that was present at all. As I said earlier, I had a sense that she could really see into me and through the personality levels, and she saw something there that she felt she could support in bringing that forward. But of course, as she always said, we had to do the work ourselves. We have to do that work ourselves. And she can be an ins inspiration. She was an inspiration for me, an example of somebody who had been very challenged in her own life and, and was able to bring that part of herself forward. And so she would see there's an expression here um, and that she used as well, which is to face ourselves at the gut level. Um, and that's what the work require, requires, you know. And it's learning that compassion of being able to hold, hold ourselves and have that light and the practices, the mantra, whatever, to be able to support through that time and gain the understanding that then I feel allows me to be able to be present for someone else who may be a, been in a similar situation or had things from their past. And Sonny Radha said to, to me, and I know she said it to others, that by doing this work and gaining the understanding and lifting out of those patterns, they don't go away forever, that's for sure, but they become the source of our greatest teaching. And, and I'm, I would say that's just in the last Wow, that I'm really, a lot is coming together and understanding that. And it doesn't mean it's ever over. <laughs> it's just, okay, we get some understanding and then, you know, then it keep going and more comes. And it's very, very freeing. And then maybe that's what liberation is. I don't know. <laughs> but every place in ourselves. And yeah, and she, I feel that she made, a promise that sh she would always be here for me. And um, and when she died, um, I had a dream not too long afterwards. And so in the last year of her life, I was um, part of a small group of women that were helping with her care. And at the same time, she was intensely helping with our spiritual development. <laughs> it was pretty intense. And so one of the things that she wanted to help me understand was helping me understand was that I was in an unhealthy relationship and, um, and I wasn't really bringing my full potential, not living to my potential. And so she didn't say, well, you have to end this relationship or anything like that. 
she just would ask questions, which I would a lot of times resist, or my pride would come up, or, <laughs> you know. And But I had to then, because I valued her so much, then just, okay, well, what if there is some truth to this? And keep going and gaining some insight. So after she passed away, I had a dream where she came, and I was so happy to see her. At it. She was happy to see me, and then sat back, and she said, so where are you at with your marriage? And in the dream, I went, oh, no. <laughs> I have to keep going. <laughs> and it felt like, of course, that's my higher self speaking to me. Uh -huh. You know, it's like, okay. But it also was like, I really want to honor all of the time that she spent with me and all the work that I did. I want to keep this going. And so that was my way of, of keeping to the promise that I made to to her. So it's quite a relationship that doesn't end <laughs> on the physical level. No, that carries yeah. forward. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've mentioned this to you before, but I think for me, the most wonderful aspect of Yashoda Ashram and just the work that's done there is how different each teacher is. Um, some of like the elder teachers and you know you're all so unique and yet you all you know had Swami Radha as your guru and so to think of all the different ways that she would interact with you and teach you and it's just really incredible she would might say something totally different than what she had said to me to someone else depending on who they were and their tendencies you know, so she was always watching what are our tendencies and for helping us to not be so attached to them. Wow. Well, and you've already spoken so much about sort of the ways that the teachings have influenced your life, both in terms of that quality of, you know, harmony, but then that sense of perhaps remembering um, something that was already in your heart. I'm wondering how you see the teachings um, helping young people today. What do you think they hold? What can they offer to young people um, in this world? Well, I won't put that question back to you because I think it's very <laughs> obvious <laughs> that you're, <laughs> you're just such an example of that and bringing forward in your life in a very unique way your own love of the teachings and your life experience and then being an inspiration for so many people. And um, what is coming to mind is that uh, recently there were some young people who've been here for the two-month karma yoga program and um, and they spoke at satsang just a couple nights ago and so I thought, well, I'll just say what they said because <laughs> <laughs> it's better than me thinking, well, what do, what do I think I'm, because I, and then we hear it a lot, you know, that, um, yeah, it's gratitude. Gratitude comes through a lot. And what one of the young women said was that um, she just appreciated so much the open space that she was given to here that she didn't need to keep fit her life up with things that she really needed this space to be able to go deeper into herself I mean I, I hear these from themes from when I was young and coming here and she said she felt more settled within herself no you know this is somebody who's been here for two months part of the karma yoga and more comfortable and at peace with her surroundings and that it feels like home and that keeps coming up all the time. And then someone else was saying that, you know, he, he had come here to, from England to Canada on a family vacation. And that, I don't know how, but the ashram, he had no idea about the ashram or anything, but somehow through that connection with young people and whatever, he got here. And, uh, and he said, he repeated some of Swami Radha's words, where she had said, everybody comes by divine appointment. 
And he really, he said, I fully believe this now. He said, I love this place. And, and he learned that he followed his intuition to get here. And he's learning how to embrace that. So even though he doesn't know what his next steps are going to be, which was causing him a lot of anxiety before ever finding the ashram, that he's learned to trust that his journey is great. He's, he's okay with it, his next steps that he's not doesn't feel that anxiety about it so i don't know i just think that the young people today comes with so, having done so much already you know it's just in that place of recognizing when something of worth is given to them that's going to help in their lives and of course it's not for everybody you know that like i said earlier i think that these times that we live in are are bringing that more forward that kind of question like what is this all about and the changes that we're facing i have a lot of hope i have a lot of hope and a lot of gratitude too in my life for the the teachers that have led the way and uh, our particular lineage of teachings i take it takes a lot to live the teachings. <laughs> and that we've got these examples, of course, not only in our tradition, but we have these examples that time. We know how to work with the human condition that the traditions do. They understand. We all have to decide what we want to do with that knowledge. The wonders live on and carry on through teachers like you and dedicated and committed people who are willing to live the practice. Yeah. And also when we hear, Swami Lalitananda spoke about that after we heard what the young folks had to say the other mm -hmm. night, that when we share what they get from the experience, then that inspires us because that's the teachings that are reflected, not just getting it, of course, there's going to be lots of challenges. This doesn't happen in two months, but but there's something that people are receiving and that that keeps us it's just going. Well, and I can certainly speak of my own experience that there's great potential for growth and sense of peacefulness through both the teachings and the, the setting and the place of the ashram. And there's so you speak of gratitude and I just feel nothing but deep, deep gratitude um, for the teachings, for Swami Radha, and for you for sitting down and having this <laughs> chat with me. It's so delightful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you because it's it's helped me bring forward in a way that it's just really been beneficial for me as well to keep diving back into the experience that of bringing mm -hmm. those memories and teachings for stuff. So thank you, Katie. Thank you. And I hope that it's inspired listeners to reflect on their own journey um, and perhaps their next steps towards whatever it may be and towards the light. Thank you very much. Namaste. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this episode. Yashodra Ashram is located on the unceded traditional territory of the Tanaha and Sanaixt peoples. You can learn more about the ashram by visiting our website at yashodra.org. You can also follow us on Instagram and YouTube. Until next time, I'm Katie Taher, and this is My Time with Radha. <laughs>